Can you explain uh, specifically, there's the claim that raising livestock has a bigger effect on climate change than the transportation industry. Um, a lot of people, when they hear that, they get confused and don't, don't understand that. Could you explain why raising livestock would affect climate change? So if you're raising cows and pigs and chickens, how does this have anything to do with climate change? Well, for one thing, they, they emit gases. <laughs> um, methane, hydrogen sulfide, um, to name a couple, and, and these are climate harming um, gases. And it may sound minuscule on a, you know individual cow level, but we're talking about a national and global system where we're talking about millions and millions of cows and pigs and chickens, tens of billions, um, billions in fact. Um, so I'm certain sound like Carl Sagan here, but uh, <laughs> but it's true. I mean, there's billions of these animals being harvested and produced in these viciously inhumane ways and consolidated uh, parts of the earth. We're seeing ozone depletion happening, and so much of this is because of the gases they produce and the waste that they produce. That is again in these super concentrated um, lagoons, for instance, that are extremely toxic. Um, so. That's, that's a huge part of the reason. The other pe another key piece is that they are a key factor in uh, global deforestation. So the spread of uh, livestock, industrial livestock operations in, say, Brazil and other places involves deforestation of the land, both for the livestock and for the grain feed for livestock. Cows aren't supposed to eat corn, as you probably know. They're supposed to eat grass. They eat grass. The rumen of a cow, the first chamber of the stomach, is about 25 gallons in size. It's a big, big place. It's a gigantic fermentation vat. And yes, it does generate some gases. Um, most of it's water and plants, and they, you know, they cough it up and they chew it again. They chew their cud, and they make it smaller and smaller until it goes, passes through into the next chamber of the stomach. That's not what cows eat in feedlots. Um, they, they eat a little bit of grass the first few months of their lives, but they spend the last three months of their lives eating 30 pounds of corn a day, or corn products, corn derivatives, a number of different things. <clears throat> and the thing about a cow's stomach is that it's a giant vat of bacteria. The cows don't actually eat grass, and they don't even get anything from the grass. The grass goes in there and feeds bacteria. The bacteria break down the cells. They take the nitrogen out. That's for the bacteria. And then they slowly sort of work on the grass and break it down a little bit as well. And the cow poops most of it out, uh, the grass part, because it's not really digestible. But when you feed a cow, you're feeding the bacteria. Now, if you go over to a feedlot, they're being fed 30 pounds of corn a day. No, the cow's not getting that corn. The bacteria are getting that corn. You're feeding, and by the way, an entirely different assemblage of bacteria, because that's different bacteria now that eat corn. And that's all starch, and starch is very digestible, breaks down very quickly, <clears throat> and breaks down quite often incompletely. And one of the incomplete products of digestive uh, metabolism is methane. CO2 is the other. Of course, that's complete digestion. Methane is an incomplete form of digestion. And they produce vast quantities, vast quantities of methane and carbon dioxide from the food we give the bacteria. The cow is just where the food is. The cow's not doing that. But the cow has to unload that gas. It's either belching it or it's coming out the other end, but it's got to come out or the cow will literally explode. It is, um, <clears throat> they have a foaming problem too that prevents them from doing that. That'll kill a cow pretty quickly. But the problem with feedlots in our modern agriculture is we're feeding them the ingredients for climate change. They wouldn't produce those kinds of gases in those quantities if they were being fed grass. So it's not just cows, it's how we grow cows that does it. Just a quick point about methane. So methane is a super greenhouse gas, um, 30 times more potent than CO2. Um, in fact, the new science says it's really like 105 times more potent than CO2. Um, so that's the reason, the other big reason why um, an animal agriculture has a big impact on the climate. Going back to, uh, to 
the question of what is the immediate experience of the pesticides and insecticides, how it affects us. One of the things is that the insecticides and pesticides are full of nerve attacking uh, results, which is what kills the pesticides, the pests and the insects. Well, well, now we're eating it. We eat the food that is in the pesticides and insecticides, and guess what's cropping up all over? So much more multiple sclerosis, so much more Parkinson's. You can go down the line of how many I illnesses we are today experiencing that affect our nervous systems. Hello. So that, that's one of the things. Um, and I wanted to ask, what are some of the um, uh, rescue missions for the, 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 the small farmer? You mentioned that there are several out there. What are, where are they? What, how do they disseminate their, their help? I'm sorry, rescue missions? I yeah, might, I think you said I might have used that term a little too loosely. Um, well, I mean, in terms of supports, right? So pub in, uh, policy supports? Yeah. yeah. I mean, where, where can they go? Where can the small farmer go? What's available yeah. to help him or her to? I mean, there's, on a federal level, there's not much. I mean, the, the subsidy system doesn't provide much of anything. The average... Um, small farmer gets uh, a pittance, if anything, uh, in terms of any form of subsidy support. Um, large scale, it almost all goes to large scale agriculture. Um, so, you know, they can look for, uh, you know, a good loan, <laughs> I suppose. They can fall into debt, which happens all the time. Um, you know, occasionally some of the uh, USDA extensions might be helpful. There are programs that, you know, in some states there are nonprofits that uh, have been working with USDA to try to improve the system to have uh, young farmers and ranchers get back into business or get into business on a small scale. So that that is happening. Like in Nebraska, there's the Center for Rural Affairs that does some excellent work around uh, that. And there is there are some small federal programs um, that do help with that. They're just small. So when, when I've driven down Route 303 going south, I see so many s people who ha would have the land to farm, but they don't have the money, and there's only one place to get food. It might be a pharmacy. It might be a, a Rite Aid, or a, uh, oh, if, they're, if it's already a bigger community, a Walmart. But, but if, if, a leg if, new legal, if new laws were to be passed, or requested even, started, for local, really local aid in that way. That could relieve some of the unemployment and at least allow people to not be hungry. And nobody seems to be thinking of that or doing anything with it. Well, there is uh, community-supported agriculture, so you and your friends could get together, find a farmer who has a piece of land, or somebody who wants to farm. Yes, but I'm yep. saying with our, our tax money. Ah. But that's a that's more difficult, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> um, how can I can I add one quick sure. thing? I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I I did speak about this earlier, but I did think it's really important. I mean, we can't just look at the federal subsidy system. It's so hard to change that. We need to try. But on state and local levels, we can develop food policies that can incentivize uh, small farmers to get back into business. We can have zoning encouragements for those plots of land to be used for agriculture for local markets. So there are ways to actually try to do that on a local and, and state level as well to build that up. Um, how does today's farming compare to farming in the past in terms of the damage it does to the soil and why does that matter? Probably, the, I would say the number one thing that farming, the number one um, insult to soil in farming is plowing, turning the soil upside down. Um, soil typically doesn't move much. It doesn't, it doesn't turn upside down. When we take dark places and make them light and cold places and make them warm and we expose things that aren't exposed to heating and drying and temperature fluctuations, um, we kill them. Soil structure is, is really a part of the, 
the activity of fungi and bacteria and the oligosaccharides that they create that tie all the different parts of the soil together. But if you look at a really good healthy soil, about half of it is just air or water, if there's water in it, and about a quarter of it is living, and only about a quarter of it is um, dirt, right? Inorganic dirt, sand, silt, and clay. Typical farming soil now is about 100% dirt. There's no pore space. Water doesn't percolate through it very well, and there's almost no living um, organisms in it. The only organisms that are in there are those organisms that can tolerate the kind of stresses that a farmer is typically um, applying to the soil on a day-to-day -day basis. So impact number one is plowing, turning soil upside down. It is not meant to be turned upside down. Everything in it, the entire ecosystem down there is disrupted by that. If we add on top of that, the insults of chemicals. Um, <clears throat> it's a little bit like icing on the cake, because we've already done a lot of damage already, but <clears throat> um, fertilizers are created as salts, and so those are generally toxic to microorganisms. They also change the pH of the soil, which has a negative effect on many microorganisms. And then pesticides are just pesticides. Um, they can be, uh, they can change pH, they can have uh, functions, uh, they can be bioactive in the soil. Sometimes they just break down. Um, it depends on the chemical. Um, I would say the least of the concerns in my mind is pesticides, and number one and two are going to be plowing and, and fertilizers. Um, yeah, it, our, our system of agriculture works really well if you're a small farmer and you farm a small patch of land and then when it gets a little bit distressed, move over to a different patch of land and use that patch of land and let the weeds grow back and the plants grow back and, and that soil has a chance to rejuvenate. What's happening when it rejuvenates is plants are growing on it but they're not being taken off of it and it's not being plowed, right? It's not that we're giving it a rest, it's that we're allowing it to be soil again and to reestablish the community while we're disturbing this one over here. That's what's really going on. When we work on very large scales, the soil never gets that opportunity. So instead, we very quickly get to the point where we have to start adding things to the soil. If it's going to behave like soil for us, we have to add those, those different things in, particularly uh, fertilizers and nutrients. Uh, earlier in the, in the seminar uh, pertaining to that uh, most of the corn and soy over 50% goes to biofuels um, and so I was doing some numbers today um, in last year's calculations of corn soy it would come out to anywhere between 425 gallons to 437 gallons of uh, biofuels being created per acre um, I think we're missing the big elephant in the room um, and that is industrial hemp. Um, hemp has 300 gallons of biofuel per acre, but it is at 20% the energy units needed, in other words, to grow uh, and produce. Um, there's this whole cannabis movement going on, but nobody is speaking about hemp as being the remedy for a lot of the problems we're having today. Um, there seems to be a movement for the smokers out there, but there's nothing for the industrial side. Not only do you get the, 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 the seed uh, and everything else, but you also get the rest of the plant and the other 50,000 uses that could be used from that into different industries. So there is a way that these farmers can go ahead and do this, these small scale farmers, but it needs to take us to go ahead and make that change. Your opinions. I don't think you're wrong about that. I think you're absolutely right. Um, you know, uh, Lyndon Johnson wanted to do a synthetic fuels program way back when, and it was pointed out to him, and I don't know if he's the one who came to the conclusion, but somebody did in his administration, that it takes more fuel to make synthetic fuel than you get from making synthetic fuel, right? So it's a net loss. If you take a look at, at the amount of energy we get in biofuel out of corn, it's a net loss. We put more energy into it, processing it, growing it, than we get out of it. 
um, it's not a very effective way to use our resources. And so there are crops out there that would be much better choices than corn and probably less damaging to the environment. Yeah, I, I would only add that, you know, I mean, in a way, biofuels, ethanol, and others can be seen as an excuse to continue uh, using and overusing uh, two things, you know, corn and cars. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it's, there's, you know, there's, you know, it's a way to just maintain the current system and not really address climate change. And it's true that actually um, the climate footprint of ethanol and other biofuels is negative, not positive. If you factor in uh, processing, the growing of the corn to begin with, uh, or soy, and then um, the shipping of it as well and the processing of it. So, um, you know, I guess also in terms of hemp, I don't, I, you know, I don't know very much about it, but it's obviously a wonder plant in so many different ways that it's so super versatile. And, you know, I think that we need to start to move toward farming and agriculture that um, replenishes natural systems and, and really uses the things we need, not just the things that the market or these, you know, the corporate profiteers at the top are demanding. So that would be part of moving back in that direction of re-diversifying our food and bringing hemp back and bringing other crops back into our systems.